And so I'm here today with uh, Professor Tim Broyd, Professor of Built Environment Foresight at UCL. Tim is on the, the core teaching team for the MSC DIBAM. Tim, tell us a little bit about how you joined UCL. Hello, Michael. Uh, yes, well, I joined UCL now about eight years ago following a, a career to that time very much in uh, the uh, the building and much more the infrastructure industry, uh, working for over my career for two or three globally operating engineering design consultants. Um, i had been in the position for the previous 15 years uh, for a couple of companies, one after the other, of being corporate innovation director, innovation research, knowledge management, sustainability, those areas, um, and increasingly working with a number of um, universities, both in the UK and, and elsewhere. Um, one of those was UCL, uh, and I guess I'd been working with people in UCL very much in the Bartlett for about 15 years before an opportunity um, arrived which seemed to suit what I wanted to do. So about eight years ago, I transferred from industry onto the um, the teaching staff, teaching research staff at UCL. I can't hear you, Michael. My apologies. <laughs> You came into UCL and you shook up the area of uh, digital within the Bartlett Faculty of the Built Environment and you, you came up with the idea of starting a new institute. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I've been involved in gradually but increasingly in, in a, a digital transformation of the, the broad construction industry for about 25 years. So obviously 25 years ago, we didn't think we were transforming an industry we thought we were trying to uh, find things to do, useful things to do with um, the emerging speed, connectivity and storage uh, abilities of, of computers. <clears throat> now, this developed over the years into something which is now called BIM, Building Information uh, Modeling. Um, and is now one of a number of uh, devices and methods and procedures we use to try and understand virtually how uh, a designed facility, be it building or infrastructure, can be properly and efficiently developed and delivered, and how the information used in those phases, the, the design and, and delivery, can then be used forward into operation and, and maintenance. Um, now, this, as I say, has been a gradual journey. I apologise for the use journey, but it probably is that uh, for me. And, and a few years ago, it seemed very clear that there would soon be then a, a major um, kick into the use of these types of techniques um, in the UK, principally by the UK government demanding as a procurer that uh, within X years from 2011, actually by 2016, that, that all projects uh, they procured will be undertaken within a um, a BIM uh, environment. And so it seemed natural then <coughs> that um, UCL, certainly being one of the world um, top 10 universities, um, should really be not only aware of what's going on, but seeking to lead in uh, um, in areas of its choice. So you're a natural person to bring in to UCL. And we met a few years ago now with my specialism in facilities and yours in assets. Uh, and we were put together within the Institute. So going forwards, you probably wouldn't blow your own trumpet to the extent that you would call yourself the uh, leading industry figure. But let me say that you, you are seen as that. Could you tell us a little bit about how your relationship with the Institute for Civil Engineers developed, for example? First of all, thank you for flattering me. <coughs> it might get you nowhere, <coughs> but you never know. Um, yeah, the, my involvement with the Institution of Civil Engineers um, which happens to be the world's oldest 
um, Professional Engineering Institute, uh, initially um, created in the year two, uh, no, 1818, so we've recently had our, our bicentenary, um, goes way back uh, and it sort of paralleled my career. So I had um, an increasing involvement with um, the ICE over quite a number of years. I'm both a chartered member and then became a, a chartered uh, fellow of the, the ICE. Um, and I guess about probably 12 or 13 years ago now, um, because of certain experiences I'd had uh, both commercially and with the ICE, I was asked to create the ICE's um, policy committee. Uh, up to that time, I have to say, no one really knew how policy was developed and they felt they needed a, a new body of people to not so much set the policy, but to engage with um, both members and people outside the institution to, to lead on the development of policy. Um, this seemed to go very well. Um, and within a few years, um, I was invited to become subject to election by ICE Council, um, a vice president, and a couple of years later, invited to, to get into the, the succession line as president. So uh, November 2016 to November 2017, I was really humbled to be president of, of this institution. And that, that was an exciting period for those of us that were watching the the impact that you were having and the um, the enthusiasm that you brought to that role. Watching uh, so much from the sidelines with great envy, often as you as you well know. And yes. um, so that that enthusiasm and that um, the level of knowledge that you bring was one of the things that I really have enjoyed over the years. And is this something that you can bring? Do you feel? Um, Sorry, you have been bringing to the Diaban program over many years. But how much of the, that seniority, that knowledge, that enthusiasm can you transfer to the, the, let's say, the building information modelling module that you will be delivering on the Diaban program this year? Well, I run a module, as you very well know, Michael, um, which is on the principles of BIM. Um, as in the whole of the the Diaban program, we within that module. We don't teach people how to use particular computer programs. We don't teach people how to cut code. We don't teach people how to press which buttons on uh, on which bits of software. What we try to do is to help people understand the, the power that BIM can have in um, developing much more efficient processes, end-to-end -end processes, um, where you're data-centric in a project rather than task-centric. So we, we aim to teach people um, how information almost needs to go from start to end of a job. And the end is really decommissioning or refurbishing before you start spinning off uh, another project. Um, so the majority of the of the module is is given by guest lecturers. I top and tail it at either end. The reason I invite guest lecturers in isn't because I'm lazy, though that might be the case. Um, <laughs> But it's more that um, I can provide, or through me, uh, the, the students on the module can be given access to people at the top of their game from a wide variety of different perspectives. So we have someone from the British Standards Institute talking about why standards are important, how they've been developed, how they're being used for BIM both initially from a UK perspective and then being transferred into international standards, uh, ISO standards. We have a, a major asset owner talking about the perspective of BIM in developing a, a 16 billion pound railway. Um, we have a tier one contractor. We have a leading design consultant. We have a, someone from a major construction software house, etc. cetera. Um, so we're looking at the same um, process and BIM is not software, it's a, it's a software enabled process. And we're looking at it from a number of quite different perspectives to try and understand then the questions that each of these stakeholders are asking, um, what they need to put into it and what they should realistically get out of it and how it can add value both to them and to the whole project team and ultimately to the whole project. 
Well. Yeah. So you share, and this is this is one of the things that I really like. My vision for getting the very best minds behind you in terms of the delivery of this lecture, and that it's it's exciting to think that in each 90 minute to two hour uh, opportunity in an online environment, there's a, there's a chance there to, to hear from the minds of the people who are really doing the stuff. So a very practical introduction to BIM. And as you say, it's not, it's not about code writing, but, but your practical abilities are immense. And I, I understand you may have built your own car. Is that right? Oh, I assembled a car. You know, it's, uh, it's a small uh, rude people would call it a kit car. I would call it a home assembled car. Um, it's a small, um, hasn't got doors. It's got uh, fabric uh, uh, doors, if you like. Two door, um, ultra low weight sports car. Uh, that is a lot of fun when the sun's shining. So, so seniority in the industry and enthusiasm for BIM, practical ability to build a car. I think the the students on the programme are going to really enjoy the lectures. And if there isn't anything else that you particularly want to tell us about yourself now, Tim, I think we'll call it a day and say thank you very much for your time. Well, I think the one thing I would say, Michael, is that um, because we have to, to teach online for for this first term, um, the, the way we're going to go about it is I'm going to ask my lecturers to um, record uh, a lecture of about 45 minutes. I'll also ask them to record this sort of chat or discussion you and I are having right now so that we can get a bit under the under the surface of the, the lecture and then provide time uh, as far as we can for for people to engage in a, in a discussion with me or, or, or with each other. Um, right. It'll be different than last year. I hope it'll be just as much fun. Well, you're, uh, as you know, you and I have been competitive when it comes to student feedback and occasionally you've edged me and occasionally I've edged <laughs> you. Um, so we'll we'll compete for that this year. But Tim, thank you very much for your time. The competition's on. Thank you so much, Michael. Okay, bye for now. Bye.